Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss macromolecules. And as the name implies, it's, it's a, going to be a conversation about big molecules. Because big molecules are extremely significant in biological organisms. As it turns out, though these big molecules are made up of, of smaller atoms, of course, these larger macromolecules contribute immensely to biological organisms. And there's really four classes of macromolecules that are significant. Things like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And so when you get into a conversation about macromolecules or big molecules, one of the things that always comes up is that uh, a lot of these macromolecules are made up of smaller ones that are joined together to form larger ones, sort of like a, a large train is made up of individual cars linked together. You can see here, this is a, a sugar connected to another sugar connected to another and another and another. And so it, the more sugars you have, the larger the molecule can be. And as it turns out, these large molecules can be really significant. There, there's so many different functions that I, I can't really get into it. So this particular video is a discussion about how macromolecules are formed and how they're broken down. So the creation and destruction of macromolecules. In other words, um, the making and breaking of macromolecules. And so, yeah, there's literally thousands of atoms that, are, uh, that compose these macromolecules. And again, there's four major classes that we're gonna consider. And so, one of the first things that I want to say about macromolecules is that they're often polymers. They don't have to be exactly a polymer, but they're often polymers. And but what we mean by that in chemistry is that a polymer, the prefix poly means many. And so mer translates to parts. So literally this means many parts. And they're made up of similar and identical building blocks that are linked together covalently. So uh, I mentioned a, a train, but it could also be uh, tree lights uh, linked together. It could be a string of popcorn like this. It could be a string of pearls. And so they're identical subunits, which are these little blue circles that are linked together. And what's fascinating is that you think that that may not uh, appear uh, diverse, but in fact you can. You can have linear polymers, uh, you can have more than one chain. So this is, could be one strand, and this is a double strand. You can even have triple strands. You might be familiar with the fact that uh, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. That's a, just an example of this. We'll talk about that in the future. But you could even have branching. Like you can have these, these parts branching off like this in, in, a, in a numerous ways. You could even have cross-links between them, holding them together like that. And so there's a lot of diversity there. So what I want to say is that uh, these many MERS, it all comes down to individual MERS being linked together. And so what we call those are monomers. So mono meaning one. And so if I get into this and, and started saying, well, a monomer, I'll just represent it as a single circle like this. So mono meaning one or one part, monomer. So everything's going to be mer, monomer. And so the monomers are the building blocks. You need to have monomers. So either the cell creates monomers or the cell needs to take them in through food, usually. And so once you have one monomer, then you could connect it together, of course, to make two. And so we'll, we'll take a look at this and how this works. And so one monomer connected to a second one is called a dimer. And so... Here we have uh, monomer, and then we have dimer, and we can si symbolize it like this, so too. Sometimes a dimer can also be called a bimer. Bi meaning like bicycle, di meaning also two. So bimer, dimer, like that. And then oligo is a, is a prefix that means a few. And so if you had, you know, you, you might be wondering, well, how? what do you mean by a few? That's sort of a qualitative. Well anywhere from three to four to five to 25 like that, just a few monomers connected together forming an oligomer. And these are fairly significant. You'll find just a little foreshadowing. You'll find these oligo 
saccharides, which are uh, small chains of sugars found on the outside of the plasma membrane of cells. And you can also find uh, oligonucleotides are very important in terms of DNA synthesis. They act as primers uh, in the cell. These oligonucleotides are RNA. And then uh, if you're performing a, a PCR reaction, which is DNA replication outside of the cell, you would use DNA oligomers or oligonucleotides to, to uh, attach to a particular sequence. And then poly means many, and so you get this, you get a lot of monomers connected together. And so what do we mean by that? Anywhere from hundreds to thousands, like that. And so you can really get huge macromolecules. But it all begins with the monomer. And so, you know, in terms of creating polymers, you just simply add more monomers. In terms of going from a polymer to a monomer, in other words, you're going to digest this and break it down into a monomer, you need to then break these bonds, and then monomers will be released. You break this one, a monomer is released. You break this one, a monomer is released. And so um, each one of these has significant functionality, and, and we'll get into that in, in future conversations. But I want to do, uh, sort of discuss the chemistry of the making and breaking of these uh, macromolecules or polymers. If you started off with a short polymer like this, maybe even an oligonucleotide, or I'm sorry, a oligomer right there, an oligomer, and you wanted to attach a new monomer to it, so you wanted to create this. This is called, in chemistry, mostly in chemistry it's called a condensation reaction because water is produced as a result of adding a new monomer. Usually in a biological setting, this is called dehydration synthesis. Synthesis implies that you're making something, and dehydration uh, invokes the fact that you're losing water. Water is removed when one monomer attaches to the uh, existing chain. And so the monomer usually provides the, a hydroxyl group, and it's attached to the hydrogen of the, of the growing chain, and therefore H2O is liberated. And of course, this is going to require an enzyme to do this. An enzyme is a protein that helps speed up chemical reactions and acts as a catalyst. It's a biological catalyst. And so the enzyme that is involved in this is often called a polymerase. And so if I were to illustrate this, let me just make up some sort of generic monomer like this. So if I had one monomer connected to another monomer, what I would get is a dimer like this, plus water. And so this is what we mean by dehydration synthesis. So you put these two together and, and water is liberated. I, let me give you an example of this other than these circles. That if I had an, uh, a peptide, for example, if I had an amino acid like this, here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, here's the R group coming off of it here, and here's the carboxylic acid like this. And so this represents this. One monomer, let me erase a little bit over here to give myself some room. <laughs> Perhaps I could have chosen a larger eraser. And let's go put that water up here so you can see it. Okay, so one amino acid plus another amino acid, and that's representing this guy right there. And so here we are. And then here's the carboxylic acid coming off the side here. So let me change colors for emphasis. Let's go blue. So if I wanted to link that monomer to that monomer, you can see here water would be eliminated right there. And then what you would get is a bond between these two monomers, which I'll emphasize also in blue right there. Of course, it's not writing right there. And so this is how this circle and this circle linked together is here and here and then there's the bond between this monomer and this monomer and I've created a dimer. And so this is a dehydration because you're losing water synthesis. It's also called condensation because water is being released. And so the opposite of a dehydration synthesis is something called a hydrolysis reaction. So the name it really speaks just like the other one did. Dehydration synthesis means you're losing water and you're making something. This is you're adding water and you're splitting something. Lysis means to split. To lysis is to split. 
And so if you had a mono, if you had a, a polymer of some kind and you wanted to digest it, digestion is hydrolysis. Water comes and cleaves and cuts one of the monomers away. In so doing, it, the addition of the water completes the hydroxyl group in one and adds the hydrogen of the other. And so, again, this is neat. you need an enzyme to catalyze this as well, because though water is capable spontaneously of digesting macromolecules into simple monomers, it requires an enzyme if you want to speed this up. And of course, uh, it wouldn't hurt to have a little warm as well to speed up the collision process. And so there's enzymes called hydrolases that are capable of doing this. Let me, let me show you a little animation of this. I think it might be more clear if I did that. If you had some monomers like this, check this out. These look like green jelly beans, but say if you had a, a monomer here and a monomer here and you wanted to link them together. Well, they would come close enough together, but you need, uh, you need some speed, so you need, you need some warmth, and you probably need an enzyme. And so let me just back that up a little bit because it came strong right here. This is called a a dehydration synthesis and the enzyme involved in a dehydration synthesis is a polymerase because you're making a polymer you're adding monomers together and the suffix ace replaces uh, or is added to the end of the word polymer now polymerases are extremely critical polymerases are how we build new DNA and how we make RNA we, we just put a DNA in front of it DNA polymerase RNA polymerase we also have protein uh, construction this way, and the, the ribosome is where this polymerase enzyme e exists in the large subunit. And so check out what's happening here between the two monomers. It's a great illustration of a dehydration synthesis. Check it out. So they come together, and look, water is liberated, and then you have a linkage between them, and you can keep doing that. So then you have a dimer and a ligamer, and you're on your way. Now, if you wanted to digest this, just the opposite is needed. You need to add water, and then water will come in and cleave or break these bonds in, into monomers. But of course you need the enzyme hydrolase. And so these hydrolytic, hydrolytic enzymes or hydrolase will come along, add water, and then split it up. The enzyme's just providing a alcove or a space where the reaction can occur more readily. It doesn't actually participate in the chemical reaction, but rather just catalyzes it and it can be used over and over again, as you know, uh, if you have any background in enzymes. So, of course, let's see here. <laughs> let's see if this will work. Okay, so um, what I'm saying here is if you had, for example, a, a polymer like this and you wanted to digest it, say you were eating something and this is some kind of food, and you wanted to break it down. Well, you would break it down with water. So water comes along and it simply splits this and it releases a monomer. And that's called a hydrolysis for water splitting hydrolysis. And this is how you break, I'll put an addition here. This is how you break a, a, uh, a polymer into a monomer hydrolysis. And so this is rather important as well because the thing is, when we eat food, let me draw this like this, something large, like ultimately food is composed because we're, we're consuming proteins and polysaccharides and nucleic acids. This is basically a, a polymer and it, it's too large to enter into a cell. So it's incumbent upon a cell to digest it extracellularly. So in other words, these cells right here line the inside of our digestive system. Like for example, they line the inside of our small intestine. So are you ready for this? This is kind of cool little physiology here. So these cells will secrete these hydrolytic enzymes like a hydrolase. And of course, some of the cells in the digestive system, uh, maybe this isn't the greatest example of it, contain these cells called goblet cells that release water in, in the form of mucus in here. So you have water, and so you have hydrolytic enzymes in water, so you're ready to go. So then here comes the big polymer. And so when the big polymer comes down the pipe, if you will, this enzyme helps to hydrolyze and cleave the bond into a monomer. So 
Hydrolysis occurs extracellularly in order to get a monomer. And why would you want a monomer? This, this is, of course, absurdly drawn out of scale. <laughs> it's like the monomer is almost larger than the whole cell. The point is, this monomer is so small is that it can then diffuse across the cell membrane because it's in high concentration. It'll simply diffuse, and then cells can absorb whatever the monomer is. So the cells that line our digestive system are really good at secretion of water and hydrolytic enzymes, and they're really good at absorbing. This is called epithelial tissue, which is a bunch of cells that are closely packed together that are good at uh, secretion absorption. And then, you know, what's interesting is I mentioned that a lot of hydrolysis occurs on the outside of a cell. And then once you go inside the cell and you, and you have, say, a bunch of amino acids, this is when the cell will want to link them together to produce its own protein. So that enzyme that I was describing a moment ago that is being released, and it's like, well, how did the cell make an enzyme? It's a big chain of amino acids. It can make an enzyme because the food the protein that we were eating prior to this were broken down into amino acids and then through dehydration synthesis the cell creates a polymer and then releases it to the outside pretty cool and so what's also interesting is that sometimes some cells need to digest within the cell and one of the great cells that does this is in our blood it's let me illustrate it like this it's a big white blood cell and a white blood cell has these little tiny organs inside. They're like little stomachs called lysosomes, like bodies of lysis. So inside here are those hydrolytic enzymes that we've been talking about. So hydrolysis can occur in here. Now, why is that? Because uh, white blood cells are in the business of devouring and uh, consuming bacteria. And so when they consume something very large, it enters in when the membrane st stretches out through phagocytosis, a food vacuole comes in, and then this needs to uh, fuse with the lysosome and be broken down by these hydrolytic enzymes. Of course, the discussion of this will come in a, in a separate uh, video, but I just wanted to point out that a hydrolysis occurs in lysosomes, and there's a lot of lysosomes in white blood cells. And so... Uh, in conclusion, you know, from just a, a pool of monomers, you can really, and this is polymerization, meaning making a polymer, you can really create a lot of diversity. And that's always the theme here because it's not just important in terms of function, but sometimes you want to create uh, interesting architecture because that increases your, your functionality as well. And so depending on whether it be one chain or two chains or branching, um, What's fascinating is that these monomers can even be different than one another. So think of this. Think of this as a word if in the English language. And these represents these represent letters. So okay, how do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And you know, think it think how many different words you could spell. And you're like, well, if I had more monomers, I can create many different words. Well, think about this. If you had many, many monomers and, and these polymers were hundreds not just five or six long, but hundreds or thousands long. Think of the possible ways in which you can arrange these things. You can have A, B, B, and then G, and then I, and then J, and then A. It's almost, it's almost infinite, the possibilities of creating polymers. And so think of it this way. I mean, it's kind of a simple analogy, but I like it. It, all of these different color beads are like the monomers, and depending on the sequence of these, the primary sequence or the order of the monomers, you can get incredible diversity. And think of it just in the English language. You have 26 letters. Think of all the words in the dictionary. And so it's incredible diversity. Not only that, but these monomers are held together by other chemical bonds, which creates a three-dimensional uh, shape change or a conformation as we call it and then even more after these polymers are created and they have their three-dimensional shape and they're held together and you're like well that's incredible then you can start even attaching functional groups onto it like a phosphate and amino group and then these things start altering the shape as well so it's kind of a post polymerization modification if you're following that so just wanted to uh 
mention that. And I hope you enjoyed uh, the making and breaking of polymers. Thanks for watching.